By the way, I'd like to welcome Adam, who's our trumpeter today, and to our fine soloists. Many years ago, when my draft number was 10, and I was staring Vietnam in the eye, I noticed this cartoon in the paper. It said, options in Vietnam. Shots come out of the jungle. You decide to leave for Sweden, hide out in graduate school, use family connections to get in the National Guard. You suddenly remember you're a pacifist or you shoot back. Today, we pay special attention to those who have been willing to put themselves in harm's way um, for their country uh, and for many reasons. I don't care whether people were drafted, uh, whether they volunteered, uh, however circumstances were that they found themselves in the position of having to risk their lives on behalf of the rest of us. Doesn't matter to me. We are here today to say thank you. Uh, Lori read for you, you know what, I forgot to pray. Let's pray. <laughs> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Lori shared with you uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount says, you've heard it said of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, if a man strikes you, turn the other cheek. Don't resist evil. If they require you to walk a mile, walk two miles. Give your car, loan the money. Seems kind of unrealistic unless you read that through the eyes of Christ. Let me tell you about the setting of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is disconcerting for those of us who wish to take Scripture seriously, and I do, while also maintaining a moral ascendancy in this life, especially when discussing self-defense and the national interest. This Sermon on the Mount is challenging. And consequently, there have been many approaches to the Sermon on the Mount, mostly designed to water down the message, which is quite radical. Some have suggested it's a perfectionist message, designed for a time after Christ returns. Others have responded and said, uh, well, it's an ethic required of a few, but not most of us. And I'm reminded of G.K. Chesterton's Christian philosopher uh, who said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. The scripture, the Sermon on the Mount, speaks for itself quite clearly. The Romans, they had a practice taken over from the Persians. Soldiers and government officials could compel citizens of an occupied country or territory to carry their equipment a prescribed distance. Remember how Simon was compelled to carry Jesus' cross? That was a part of this custom, this law. The word for mile in the scripture here in the passage is never used anywhere in the New Testament again. It is a Roman-influenced word. And it's a reminder that the Roman soldier could require you to carry his pack, his spear, his whatever, his equipment, a prescribed distance. And it's a reminder that the radical ethics of nonviolence applies even in the adverse political situation of an occupying power. Jesus understood that he was part of an oppressed people, part of an occupied nation. 
He said, nevertheless, contrary to those zealots around him who were saying, lead a revolution, take up arms. He said, if a man strikes you, turn the other cheek. I guarantee you the freedom fighters in his audience, the zealots, would have believed he committed treason. Now this kind of sermon today is difficult because the minister seeking to affirm those who have given the most, yet simultaneously not affirming the evil of war. It's a slippery slope. It's difficult to navigate. War is about violence. War is about destruction. War is about killing other human beings. Jesus repeatedly rejected war and violence as the means of establishing his kingdom. That's not me telling you that. That's a clear and direct reading of the scripture. And all of this makes war a difficult proposition for God's church. Sometimes, rarely, maybe never, there's no alternative to violence and a people must go to war. But that doesn't make war a good. That does not make more war a moral good. The church must never ever become the cheerleader and remain and support needless violence and war. We must remain ever vigilant and ever critical. One of the better metaphors for the church in relation to any nation state, any nation state, is the metaphor of the prophetic gadfly. It's our job as a church not to be cheerleaders, but to be a gadfly that, that confronts the state whenever and wherever it steps beyond its limited legitimacy. Following 9-11, we fail to fulfill that function. And we live with the results of that to this day. Of course, there was going to be a response. But somehow, leaders, religious leaders, moral leaders, lost the, the strength and the courage and the conviction to say, enough. Enough is enough. Jim Hoagland wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post called Reactive, Retroactive Morality. And he said, and I quote, only after a threat has abated or passed do societies as a whole permit themselves the luxury of reflecting upon and questioning the methods and strategy their appointed guardians have used to protect them in a crisis. Was that not true? Has that not been true throughout American history? You know, Leading up to World War II, we interred the Japanese people in this country. And it took decades for us to realize that we were what? We were wrong. That's Hoagland's point. And my point is the ethic of Jesus Christ does not allow the body of Christ the luxury of simply reflecting and reacting afterward. It is the task of the church to be the unrelenting moral conscience of a nation. And I will tell you, I will tell you, first of all, I think I'm a patriot. And the statement I'm about to make is patriotic. It is in the nature of the nation state, medieval or modern, throughout world history, to try to seduce the church or any religion in that nation state into an unholy partnership. Uh, there was a, uh, a famous essay out of, uh, by a sociologist called Civil Religion. And it was the idea the guy studied all of the inauguration speeches of all the United States presidents over all of American history. And they all, without exception, tagged onto some kind of moral supreme being to give sustenance and support for what they were saying. The nation state will always do that. 
And the church must always resist that. We are to pray for our rulers. We are to support our rulers when they're right. But we must not ever allow ourselves to be co-opted. This resistance is in fact a unique political or theological heritage of those of us in the congregational church. Now that's a problem. It's a problem for ministers because when they address issues like that about how the nation state's doing something it shouldn't be doing, what do you say to me? What do I hear the next week or at the door or see the tail end of somebody walking out? They tell me what? Keep what out of the pulpit? What? Politics. Keep politics out of the pulpit. Sure. All I'd have to do to do that is keep Jesus out of the temple. Right? That was the political act that got Jesus killed. Because that temple symbolized the cooperation, the alliance between the Jewish aristocracy, the religious aristocracy, and the nation state of Rome. They worked together on, through the temple and on the temple. And when Jesus walked in there, he retook that place for God. And for that, they killed him. You can't keep that kind of politics out of the pulpit. Or the preacher has nothing to say. Now, I won't tell you who to vote for. But I will teach you values that will lead you in one direction or another. And of course... This is a congregational church. You're free to accept them or what? Tell me to take a walk. Reject them. All of this, all of this makes even more amazing the story of the centurion. Let's unpack this story. You've got this centurion. Uh, what was a centurion? Well, literally... He was the commander of a hundred men. He was a professional man of war. I think of, uh, in the army, I think of a centurion as the first sergeant. In the Marine Corps, it would be a gunny, uh, a master sergeant in the Air Force. These people are the backbone of their organization. It's not the officers. It's the senior non-commissioned officers who really make it all happen. The centurion was the backbone of the Roman legions. He was an oppressor. He was a Gentile. He was a pagan. He was a man of the world. And he was the backbone of the oppressor's armed forces. Jesus had every reason and more to hate this man. And you can be sure that many of those who follow Jesus hated centurions. Here's an insight. People are more than what they do. People are different than the labels we attach. And this speaks to politics today, whether you're Democrat, Republican, or Independent. So when we come down beneath the label. What kind of man was this centurion? He could have despised the Jewish people. Usually an occupying force does come to despise the people they occupy. But he built a synagogue. Indications are he loved their nation. He could have been brutal to his slave, which we have a problem with that today, but in that day it was part of the culture. He could have been brutal. But he loved his slave, and he sought healing for him. He could have trampled on Jewish belief, but he honored the Jewish belief system. He was human first and soldier second. You know what? Over all the many years of my ministry, I've pastored more than a few military people. They are always human first and soldier second. And the centurion was a human being of many virtues. He understood universal brotherhood. War, in many ways, requires the dehumanization of people. It's, 
it's hard to do battle against and kill, if necessary, someone you perceive in their full humanity. It's very difficult to do. But this man continued to care for people. He was a man of sensitivity. It's easy, easy to chuckle at fanaticism, but he refused to endanger Jesus by coming under his roof. He was a man of humility. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy to come under your roof. He had a sense of his own flawedness. We need that virtue. There was no entitlement in this man. And he was a man of faith. He said, Lord, I believe you can hire, heal my servant. You don't have to leave here. Just say the word. And Jesus, what? The scripture says he marveled. He marveled at the faith of the centurion. Translated is, he stared in astonishment. He was visibly impressed. And he said, in all of Israel, I have not found such faith as this. Now, let me ask you, why would Jesus be so affirming of an oppressor? Because he was able to separate act from actor, doer from deed. Sometimes very virtuous people, good people, are placed in situations where all the alternatives are tragic. And in that situation, you do the best you can do. You muddle through. It is fitting that we should honor our dead, though who have lost their lives for causes not merely their own. We can do that while being critical of war, yet warmly generous and overwhelmingly thankful for those willing to place themselves in harm's way in the belief that it was necessary for our survival. We honor them first and foremost by not placing them in harm's way except as an absolute last resort. I don't believe we've honored that practice since World War II. I think in our failure to be the kind of prophetic gadfly we in the church need to be in recent years since 9-11, we have allowed ourselves to put hundreds of thousands of our young men and women in harm's way. And I hope that changes. So, on this hallowed day, we remember. And in that remembering, I want to share with you a legend from the Civil War. Whether it's accurate in every detail, I don't know. But it carries great truth. In 1862, during the Civil War, when the Union Army, uh, there was a captain in the Union Army by the... Union Army by the name of Robert Ellicombe. And he was with his men near Harrison's Landing in Virginia. The Confederate Army was on the other side of a narrow strip of land, not very far away. During the night, the captain heard the moans of a soldier, a soldier who lay severely wounded on the field, and not knowing whether he was Union or Confederate, the captain decided to, to crawl out to risk his life and try to bring the man some medical attention. So crawling on his stomach through no man's land, he reached the stricken soldier and began pulling him towards the Union encampment. When he finally reached his own lines, he actually saw it was a Confederate soldier and that the soldier was dead. Captain lit his lantern and suddenly caught his breath. He went numb with shock. In the dim light, he saw the face on the soldier, and it was his own son. The boy had been studying music in the South when the war broke out, and unbeknownst to the father, he had enlisted in the Confederate Army. Following morning, when the son rose, heartbroken, the father asked permission of his superiors to give his son a full military funeral, despite his enemy status. His request was only partially granted. The captain had asked if he could have a group of the army band play a funeral dirge. 
But out of respect for the father, the captain's superiors gave him only one musician. And the captain chose a, burg a, a bugler, not a burglar. <laughs> he asked the bugler to play a series of musical notes that he had found in the pocket of his son. The words that go with these notes is as follows. Day is done, gone the sun, from the lakes, from the hills, from the sky. All is well, safely rest, God is nigh. Fading light dims the sight, and a star gems the sky. Gleaming bright from afar, drawing nigh, falls the night. Thanks and praise for our days, neath the sun, neath the stars. As we go, this we know, God is nigh. Amen.